What's stopping us from converting the open ocean into a massive solar power plant, to the tune of almost six times more energy than the world uses every year? Several companies are trying to do just that by floating solar panels out on the open ocean. But that raises so many questions. Won't they get smashed to pieces during storms? Why even bother with the ocean when we have land? Developing seaworthy panels is a lot more complicated than just smashing a bottle on the array and setting sail. So what makes floating solar on the ocean worth a shot? And what's holding it back? I'm Matt Farrell. Welcome to Undecided. This video is brought to you by Brilliant, but more on that later. When the news about companies like Heliorec and Ocean Sun bubbled up about putting solar panels out in the ocean, it really caught my attention. This wasn't theoretical, but was actually happening. Initially, I thought, how's it even going to work and not get torn apart by the storms? My gut reaction was that the engineering and maintenance challenges felt insurmountable and would cost way too much money. So my team and I started to dive into the world of floating solar again to see if we could find answers to those questions. If we can keep turbine towers that are taller than national monuments afloat, why can't we throw a solar panel array into the deep end of the Earth's pool? What we found was fascinating, but also raised as many questions as it answered. Now, I'll get to Helio Rec and Ocean Sun in just a minute, but there's a bigger question that we have to answer first. Does floating solar on water even make sense? And to answer that question, we'll have to start inland. Floating photovoltaics, or photovoltaics, is a relatively new branch of the solar industry. Its global installed capacity only started to expand beyond 1,000 megawatts around 2018. But the technology has become more common over the past few years, with about 3.8 gigawatts installed by 2021. Now, that's a tiny sliver of the thousands of gigawatts of solar installed worldwide. If you've been following the channel for a while, you might remember last year's video about floating solar on canals. And in case the concept is not familiar to you, know that floating PV or FPV is exactly what it sounds like. Solar panels moored in a body of water. FPV has three major benefits. Floating solar farms aren't occupying limited space on land. Solar panels on water stay cooler and therefore perform better. And bodies of water shielded by FPV are less prone to evaporation, which helps to preserve fresh water supplies. Now, these perks are the basis for ongoing projects in places like the United States and India, where miles of canals are being used to determine if FPV is a boon or a boondoggle. Now, for more details on that, check out that video. But it's that second benefit about solar performing better on water that's really fascinating. One of the largest solar farms in Europe is a great example. EDP, a Portugal utility, built floating solar on the country's Alcava Reservoir. It's not exactly a choppy ocean, but it's still important to understanding what we can get out of FPV. Now, according to Pedro Oliveira, the company's director of innovation, its FPV farm has seen increased efficiency thanks to the water's cooling effects. He cites an efficiency increase of up to 10%, along with an average annual productivity increase of around 4%. Adding on to that, a separate 2021 NL Innovation Lab FPV study found that floating systems can produce anywhere from 4 to 7% more energy than ground-based solar. So keep these FPV benefits in mind as we work through the challenges and what Heliorec and Ocean Sun are trying to do out at sea. So if FPV is already an emergent use on canals, lakes, and artificial reservoirs, we can definitely apply that same tech to the ocean, right? Not exactly. And before getting into why, if you'd like to better understand the principles behind solar power and how photovoltaics work, there's a fun and easy way to do so. I'd strongly recommend checking out Brilliant.org and the Solar Energy course, which goes into detail on key concepts like photons and photon absorption, the spectral properties of sunlight, and the band gap. Now, wrapping your head around these principles really helps understanding what's going on with the latest solar panel tech and new techniques like offshore solar. Recently, I've been going through courses like the Thinking and Code course to brush up on my programming basics. I've been trying to automate some of the repetitive tasks of my day-to-day -day work, and it's been really helping me. Brilliant has thousands of lessons from AI to electricity and magnetism. They've got something for everyone, and they're adding new lessons every single month. If you're like me, you probably think that you don't have the time to take a course, but Brilliant is built around bite-sized lessons to break down the concepts into very understandable parts. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash undecided or click the link in the description. The first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Thanks to Brilliant and to all of you for supporting the channel. So what's different about floating panels on the ocean? Well, it's kind of like the distinction between tap water and seltzer. Unlike the mostly still surfaces of the previous examples, the ocean would be constantly churning and bombarding the panels with salt. Exposure to all the salty water leaves the panels at risk of corrosion. More movement means more money spent designing reinforced frames and mooring that is strong enough to stay afloat. 
It also means risk of sunlight spreading unevenly across the panels, which lowers the energy production. Ensuring that the panels are close enough to the water to be cooled, but not too close to be overwhelmed by the waves, is yet another delicate balancing act. Plus, while the sun-blocking element of freshwater FPV can slow down algae blooms and weed growth, marine fouling is literally a whole different animal. Just like offshore wind, offshore solar structures also act as artificial shelters for aquatic life, adding another dimension to the challenges. Where there's fish, there's birds, and where there's birds, there's bird droppings. Not exactly great for solar. Now, we also can't forget the potential negative impacts on the local ecosystems, which are still unclear. Ultimately, as nice as it would be to plop freshwater FPV into the ocean and call it a day, it's simply just not that simple. Not to mention the weather. Florida hurricanes, for example, would not be kind to FPV. In fact, a study published just this past June suggests that the majority of countries are knocked out of the running for practical installation of offshore solar. According to the Australian National University researchers, that's because most of the world's maritime areas have experienced waves larger than 10 meters or about 33 feet, and wind speeds larger than 20 meters per second or about 45 miles per hour at the same time over the past 40 years. These conditions are not only linked, because in general, more forceful winds mean more powerful waves, but they can also seriously damage FPV system components like floats and cables. A dangerous example of this happened back in 2019 when Typhoon Faxai's 54 meters per second or 120 mile per hour winds actually caused a Japanese floating solar plant to go down in flames. Now keep in mind that this was an inland system installed on top of Yamakura Dam. As the wind and waves flung panels together, they overheated in close contact and sparked a fire. Now, the study's authors argue that in places where tropical storms can occur, engineering defenses against incidents like these could be prohibitively expensive. So where does this leave offshore FPV? Well, don't worry, there's still plenty of places with calm waters that can theoretically accommodate photovoltaic pontoons. After analyzing 40 years worth of weather data on wind speed and wave height, the Australian research team determined that the best locations for floating panels lies within the planet's equatorial zones, like in Southeast Asia and Northwestern Africa. And the researchers emphasized the Indonesian archipelago and the Gulf of Guinea, which is off the coast of Nigeria and Cameroon as prime examples. So what makes these sites so special? Why are their waters calmer? And what about tropical storms? Well, as we research this topic, it's at this point that I turn to a member of my channel's science advisory board, meteorologist and storm chaser Seth Price. He explained that to answer these questions, all we have to do is look at the shape of the globe. Our big blue marble happens to be wider at the equator. And consequently, as the Earth rotates, its middle is actually moving faster than its poles. This is what's known as the Coriolis effect, or the curving movement of water and air as they move over the planet's surface. The Coriolis effect is what makes storms spin. At the equator, there's no Coriolis force, so tropical storms virtually never form there or cross its bounds. Seth also added that because these physics are based on the Earth's rotation, they won't change even as the climate does. And that's particularly important to note because in light of concerns about how to adapt marine FPV to new weather patterns, it's already hard enough to design materials to, that can survive years of battering by the elements. Having to consider the risk of extreme and unprecedented weather events on top of that doesn't make things easier. Does the equator's protective barrier mean that offshore FPV is ironclad in those regions? Of course not. Otherwise, we'd probably be used to seeing solar panels bobbing on the waves by now. As Seth says, there will always be a natural scenario to destroy even the best engineered project. Wise words, Seth. Wise words. However, he also pointed out that we're also long accustomed to resilient energy generation on the ocean's surface, in the form of oil rigs and even more recently, floating wind turbines. Norwegian petroleum company Equinor created the first offshore wind farm in 2017 using the same spar platforms that are ubiquitous in the oil and gas industry. Developing technology that can weather storms, constant wave action, sea spray, and the harsh UV rays emanating from the sun is complex, but far from impossible. In fact, it's likely that we can reap the same benefits of pairing wind and solar that we get on the ground out in the ocean. Sharing grid infrastructure and operational equipment can keep costs down and combat intermittency. But is it worth the trouble though? The Australian National University research team certainly seems to think so. In that paper I mentioned earlier, its authors go far as to say that eligible equatorial regions that they highlighted enable huge energy generation potential for FPV. The combined offshore floating solar PV annual generation potential for regions that do not experience waves larger than 4 meters, about 13 feet, or winds stronger than 15 meters per second, or about 33.5 miles per hour, is 220,000 terawatt hours. This is sufficient for all the energy needs of an affluent global population of 11 billion people. But that's not all. 
The researchers proposed that if marine FPV can survive maximum wave heights of six meters, which is about 19 feet, the annual energy generation potential jumps up by a lot, to the tune of a collective production of up to 1 million terawatt hours per year. And to put these figures into perspective, our world and data list the planet's annual primary energy consumption, which is from all sources, at 167,788 terawatt hours in 2022. So who's out there actually testing the waters? Well, there's more offshore solar farms currently in operation than you might think. In Indonesia, the country's Sipalu Nopember Institute of Technology and Patamura University are collaborating with researchers at Cranefield University in England to develop offshore photovoltaics as part of the Solar to Wave project. According to Lu Feng Hyung, a mechanical engineering lecturer at Cranefield University Center for Energy Engineering, analysis of the team's designs has shown that they can tolerate waves up to 5 meters or 16 feet in height. There's also the Norway-based company Ocean Sun. Taking inspiration from the Victoria Amazonica giant water lily and aquaculture, they've developed a design with a thin, flexible membrane that's stable enough for technicians to walk on. The company has installed multiple FPV projects along the western coast of its home country, in the Yellow Sea near Shandong, China, and down the Johor Strait between Malaysia and Singapore. Its first prototype, a 6.6 kilowatt system which was commissioned by the Norwegian company Leroy Seafood for its fish farm, has been kicking since the summer of 2018. Ocean Sun also has plans underway to drop anchors in Greece, Cyprus, and Singapore this year. Now, interestingly, according to the company's websites, its products feature a boost of up to 10% in energy yield relative to other floating systems as a result of the surrounding water's cooling effect. And to back up that claim, it cites certification by the Singapore Office of the Energy Consultancy Agency, DNV, in a study conducted by Norway's Institute for Energy Technology. It also goes as far to say that the cooling is consistent enough to prevent the panels from experiencing daily thermal cycling, which basically means that they're not constantly bouncing between high and low temperatures. Ocean Sun's floaters can also withstand wind speeds as high as 270 kilometers per hour, which is about 171 miles per hour, which is really impressive. Then there's the French company Heliorec, which recently announced the successful installation of a 25 kilowatt pilot system in the port city of Brest. Now, according to the company website, the location is significant because of its notoriously high wind speeds of over 100 kilometers per hour, which is about 62 miles per hour, and high tides, which can swell up to seven meters or 23 feet. And to date, Heliorec's 10 kilowatt system in Belgium has managed to survive two storms. Perhaps most critically though, is what we know about the costs, or rather what we don't know about the costs. In a 2020 Ocean Sun investor presentation, the company claims that its systems are between 25 and 30% cheaper than conventional FPV, and 10 to 15% cheaper than ground-mounted PV. And per its 2023 second quarter and a half year report, its equipment costs are closer to that of ground-mounted PV. What Ocean Sun advertises as a 25% lower capital expenditure or capex partially comes from the fact that its floaters can easily be rolled up kind of like a beach umbrella. This allows them to be transported in a single 40-foot or 12-meter shipping container, which the company says reduces the amount of money spent on logistics. But when it comes to any more explicit information than that, data like the levelized cost of energy, LCOE, isn't clearly stated on the company website, and the most detail we get comes in the form of the claim that Ocean Sun's floaters have the overall lowest material usage of any floating PV system, enabling the lowest overall LCOE. But we'll have to take that with a grain of sea salt until we can see some more independent data. What we do know for sure is that as it stands right now, offshore solar is still very new. The projects we've discussed so far are not only experimental and small in scale, but relatively near shore. Until the technology matures, we won't be skimming sunshine off the waves of the open ocean just yet. But overall, it's less about what's possible and more about what's practical. The same strategies used by oil and gas industries to maintain floating drilling operations have already been applied to renewables in the form of offshore wind. Meteorological research indicates that areas near the equator are probably offshore solar's best bet. Resources exist to meet the concept's design challenges, but is it ultimately worth the cost and the potential ramifications for aquatic life? We'll have to see about that. So what do you think about offshore solar? Is it a good direction? Jump in the comments and let me know. Be sure to check out my follow-up podcast, Still To Be Determined, where we'll be discussing some of your feedback. And thanks to all my patrons who get ad-free versions of every single video. Your support really does help to keep me and my team going and delivering you these videos every single week. See you in the next one.